On your Friday episode of Locked On Raptors, the Toronto Raptors fall 114.99 to the Philadelphia 76ers. The script for this one, pretty much exactly what you'd expect in a Toronto Raptors loss in 2023-24. But we'll dig into why there's not all that much alarm overall, as this is a particularly challenging matchup for this new revamped version of the Toronto Raptors. All coming up on today's show. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Friday, November the 3rd, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the site that doesn't really work anymore, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Lockdown Raptors, and of course, you can go and find the show and our little community around the show over on Discord. The link to join our Discord server is in the description of the podcast. It is free to do, and it is a great spot to come talk Raptors ball uh, and other things too. We got fantasy basketball talk. We've got movies. We got sports cards and collectibles. All sorts of different channels to scratch any itch you might have just to talk with friendly people from the internet. Uh, seemingly a rare thing to find these days. But the Lockdown Raptors Discord gets that done. Come hang out. We would love to see you in there. Again, link in the description. Or you can shoot me a DM if the link is expired and we will get you that invite. Um, you can find the show for free, of course, on all your favorite podcast apps. Please subscribe, follow, rate, review, tell a friend, all that good stuff. We're also on YouTube. If you go subscribe to the YouTube channel, make sure you hit the little bell to get the notifications whenever episodes are about to premiere so you can come and chat with the fine folks who hang out in the chat on the YouTube premieres as well. Uh, and today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to 100 bones all right let's get into it on today's show breaking down a 114.99 loss to the philadelphia 76ers on thursday night you know not the most inspiring effort coming off of a thrilling game against the milwaukee bucks on wednesday where everyone was feeling awesome but i also don't think you can take that much from this game in terms of negatives or things that portend further bad things down the line this was as schedule lossy as schedule losses get. This was their sixth game in nine nights to start the season. Uh, their second back to back in the span of seven days. It had been it's been a really loaded schedule for the Raptors so far. And you couple that with a matchup in Philly that is particularly challenging. And we'll get into why. And I don't think it, this was a terribly surprising result. And frankly, I found a lot of solace in the fact that the Raptors hung into this one, you know, deep into the third quarter, looking like they'd make a game of it before the legs kind of went away. The jump shots weren't falling. The decision making seemed kind of tired. And, you know, you know, you get sleepy brain, right? When you're kind of going for that long, that hard for two nights in a row. Um, you know, I, I think pretty justifiable and understandable loss, all things told. Uh, we, of course, will do uh, the Scotty Barnes check in. And then actually, we're going to debut a new segment that we're going to do after every single Toronto Raptors loss this season, which will be, what did Scotty and Grady do? Because those two dudes are the guys who, you know, most have the most like future upside potential and joy and all that stuff um, that they're putting out there. Obviously, Scotty more so than Grady Dick so far, but that'll be segment number two. We'll also do the good, the bad, and the hmm to round things out. But let's start off with my biggest takeaway from this game. And frankly, it is just that. I'm not worried about this loss because I think the circumstances behind it are all pretty understandable. And in particular, I just think this Sixers matchup is going to be a really challenging one for the Raptors, at least, you know, with the current construct of the team that they have. Right. You know, I think in particular, we saw this as kind of an encapsulation of what the new world and reality is for Pascal Siakam. The second game in six nights, seven nights, whatever it is that Siakam has been kind of diminished in role against the Sixers. And frankly, I don't think that's surprising. I think this is a byproduct of the changing way the Toronto Raptors are playing basketball. And I don't think it has to be a bad thing if you're willing to sort of accept that there are going to be nights where the number two option on the team doesn't quite get cooking like your typical number two option would. And I think particularly the reasons for Pascal Siakam kind of being quiet in the last couple of games against the Sixers it is all tied to the big, important, good thing that's happening, which is 
the team is now flowing through Scotty Barnes. And that, I think, is the right thing to do, right? He's obviously taking the mantle and running with it. And, you know, I think this season really had to be about seeing what you have in Scotty. Can he kind of do the thing and be the guy? And boy, oh boy, has he ever been the guy so far, as we'll get to coming up in the next segment. But I think for Pascal... Think about the last few years where Pascal's had a ton of success against Philly. He's been really good. Obviously, I think one of the best games he's ever played was game five in the playoff series against the Sixers in Philly, where he was just masterful across the board. And he's had a lot of really nice regular season games against Philly in recent years. But think about the context in which those really great games came. He was doing the sort of heliocentric probing pick and roll creator thing where he was the offense. Everything flowed through Pascal Siakam on that end. And particularly against the Sixers, we have Joel Embiid, who's this massive rim deterrent. Pascal Siakam was carving up the Sixers in those games with just excellent, excellent mid-range, uh, both facilitating, you know, finding the, the right reads and stuff from there, but also just like banging in mid-range jumpers over Joel Embiid in a drop defense. And I think That was great. You know, that's awesome. But we know that's not how the Raptors want to play anymore. And I think that's fine. And I think we saw in this game the effects on Pascal Siakam and and, you know, as as well the game on Saturday. Uh, The effects of Pascal Siakam now moving into a more sort of complementary role to Scotty Barnes, who is the leading force, driving force of this team. And in particular in this matchup against the Sixers, you know, we've seen, you know, games against, uh, you know, the Bulls game against the, 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 the Bucks, for example, like there were times in which they could get Pascal his looks in spots where, you know, he's comfortable going to, you know, sort of created manufactured looks for him designed plays where it's Pascal who's getting set up to go and have success in a position in which he succeeds. We, there's not really as many opportunities for that against the Sixers because all the places where Pascal likes to go and operate his office as a secondary piece, a guy who's going to improvise post-ups, get his, get his early work done, get those quick seal outs and quick finishes early in the offense. The places where Pascal's going to operate the most are also the places where the seven foot two frame of Joel Embiid hulks over everything. Right. And I think that's sort of the contextual thing here for Pascal is there will be matchups, plenty of them, where he is able to kind of imprint himself as a number two option more effectively than this one because Joel Embiid is a singular force in the NBA. Of course, you know, we, we have our issues watching Joel Embiid. He's kind of a drag, he flops, blah, 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 blah. He's also bloody incredible. And defensively in particular, he's such a re- deterrent. He's such a one-man defensive system unto his own that it's just not going to be easy to score against that dude, especially if you're not operating in the places where we know Pascal can really operate, which is as, again, that sort of probing pick and roll creator, taking his time, sort of keeping the dribble alive and finding things and, and things to exploit over the course of a possession. They're just not having him do that anymore. We know that it's a thing that's in his back pocket, and I think it'll be a very useful thing down the line for the Raptors to be able to go to. I actually would have liked to have seen more Pascal kind of in the Dennis Schroeder role in this game. I did not think this was the greatest creation game for Dennis Schroeder in the half court in particular, where the Raptors were not especially good. Um, But I think there's a, you know, it, it makes sense that they're not prioritizing that. We know like that's a known Pascal can be that type of player who is running your offense and having things flow, flow through him and have it be pretty effective. But this is not a time for testing out things that are known. This is about testing out things that are unknown or, you know, untapped. And I think they made the right call in having Scotty kind of be the primary initiator in this game, the guy through whom most of the things flowed. It's just Pascal is going to have nights where as a number two option, it's just not going to all be there for him. And he's not going to be able to cook in the way he typically can. You know, he's still obviously had his moments in transition. He's still automatic bucket basically every time down the floor. Um, The team itself is basically an automatic bucket every time down the floor. But I I think we really saw just the the way the changing shape of this team is going to affect Pascal. Look, there will be long term questions and, you know, contemplations about Pascal's fit within the team. I don't think the first six games, two of which have come against this particularly challenging matchup, you know, also coached a team coached by a guy who knows exactly how the Raptors butter their bread and exactly how to neutralize that in Nick Nurse. Um, I don't think you can take too much from these two games where Pascal has kind of looked as a bit of like a sidecar passenger more than a, a true number two option. He's been the true number two in a lot of these other games, and I'm not so, so concerned about that. You know, this was not a game where the Raptors kind of did the stuff that they got to do to win the game on the margins either, right? Like transition, the Sixers actually dominated them there in terms of volume. 
Raptors only got it on the run like 16 and a half percent of the time for cleaning the glass, which is just not where they need to be. Um, again, they scored 175 points per 100 possessions in those spots, which is unbelievable, extremely cool to see, but they didn't get on the run nearly enough for that incredible efficiency to really kind of tilt the balance. You know, 82.1 points per 100 in the half court in this game. You know, they held the Sixers to 87 and a half, but the Sixers just ran down their throats in this game 21 and a half percent of their possessions were in transition and you could see it right like the raptors just you know the defensive rebounding wasn't quite there for them in this one they didn't quite run off the misses that they typically like to run off like they were doing against the bucks um none of the sort of indicating factors for this game on top of the sort of matchup disadvantage they're at in this one went their way and a credit to the Sixers, man. They look good. That maxi and bead spine. You know, if you're holding that offense based around those two guys to 87 and a half points per 100 in the half court, that's pretty good. Like you'll take that. But overall, the Sixers team is really good and losing a couple games to them to start the season to me is not any sort of cause for panic. Um, and again, you know, it's because they're doing the right thing in the big picture having Scotty Barnes kind of be the lead dude. And he was fantastic in this game as we're about to get into. But because of that, the shape of this team is just not super conducive to maximizing all they can in the half court just yet. They'll sort things out. I'm sure later matchups against Philly will go a little bit more smoothly. They'll have more stuff built in for Pascal. Um, but this game, obviously, I think was kind of an example of what you have to expect. We've been so used to Pascal walking into 25, 5 and 5 every night a different reality it doesn't mean he can't be an effective positive player um in fact of all the raptors regulars the toronto raptors offense is the best when pascal siakam is on the floor right now per a very small you know uh, a sample on off summary per nba.com um but still I, I think you know one off blip it's fine they get a couple days off now the schedule eases up they have two days off between each of the next three games that, I think, is a sight for sore eyes for this Raptors team and a sight for sore knees, a sight for uh, just like sore joints from all the ball they've played so far. Either way, we'll come back on the other side and we'll get into Scotty Barnes. And boy, oh boy, are we going to get into Scotty Barnes? Because I can't stop talking about Scotty Barnes. We'll also talk about Grady Dick as we debut the new segment, What Did Scotty and Grady Do? That's all coming up on today's show. But first, today's show is brought to you by our dear pals over at Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers the way it should be. It's not you against some sort of shadow expert in a basement running lineups all day long to optimize what they're throwing out there. No, it's just you against the projections, courtesy prize pick. And all you got to do is pick more or less on stats for whatever players you want to pick in any sport under the sun. You can do cross sport entries as well. It's super fun. You can bet you can pick up to two to six players and whether they will get more or less on those stat projections. And if you're right on all six, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry with basketball season here you can now pick combo projection projections as well across football and basketball from the specials league a league created specifically for combo projections that include things like you know 10.5 as a combo of travis kelsey receptions plus lebron james three pointers made that's a beautiful thing that's super fun if you want to liven up if you're a fan of many sports you can go and liven up your sports watching experience with the very simple daily fantasy over at prize picks Quick withdrawals as well. You get easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types. It's what all makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. And they offer weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday, where each Tuesday's Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA to use the code locked on NBA. For a first deposit match to 100 bucks with prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, we continue on here. Your first listen of the day. Thanks so much for tuning in and being along. If you have not yet, we got lots of shows from earlier this week reacting to the Bucks win, reacting to uh, the weekend that was and the Blazers loss, which was very nasty. If you want to go relive some nasty, nasty stuff that we've put behind us from earlier in the week, you can do all of that. Um, but let's dive in now to a new segment here on the podcast that we'll be doing Every time the Raptors lose a game, because I don't want to stew in the bad stuff all the time. We'll do that in the first segment whenever we have to. But segment number two, after losses, for the rest of the season will be, what did Scotty and Grady do? Because those two dudes, as it stands right now, are the sort of joy bringers, even when the team is losing. Less so for Grady Dick last night, which we'll get to in a second here. But of course, Scotty Barnes, 
what can you say about what this dude is doing so far? Last night, what did Scotty do? 24, 8 and 8 on 9 of 16, 2 of 7 from deep, 4 of 4 at the line. Uh, and just had me emanating all sorts of ridiculous sounds from my living room as he was putting up 12 points on 4 of 4 in the first four minutes of that game. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous what Scotty Barnes is doing so far. It, it really is. It, it is. It, I, I, I think even like the biggest Scotty optimists out there probably couldn't have seen every single element of his game getting better. I think it would have been disingenuous to say that you predicted every single element of Scotty Barnes's game getting better to this degree, but he really has. And credit to him, credit to all the people who saw it coming, I guess. Like he's just been an absolute treat to watch and his impact on this team has been enormous. Uh so far this season the Raptors are 18.3 points better per 100 possessions when Scotty Barnes is on the floor. They are really, really just a thrill to watch when he's out there. And I, I just, it's, you can grab from all over the pull up threes, the catch and shoot threes, which look like so good in rhythm. The defense has been just startling on both ends. Just the stat line alone, 21, 10 and six with a steal and two blocks on 61% true shooting. Like this is game changing context altering stuff. For this team, he's got a 26.2% usage rate as well. So he's carrying that efficiency so far through six games. Um, you know, he's clearing it like in a very real way on very high efficiency. He's grabbed the mantle, and this team is absolutely right to be flowing th things through Scotty Barnes. He has been their best player so far this season, and it's not particularly close. I'm just having just so much fun with this, man. It's a treat. And it kind of puts all of the bigger picture questions about what this team's going to look like down the line, unless they have a dire context and dire framing, right? Like, yes, they will have to figure out the whole uh, three enormous pending UFAs thing. That's not a good thing to have hanging over your team. But whatever the answers are to those questions feel a lot easier to get to and a lot less essential to the health of the franchise going forward when you have scotty barnes playing like this dude who right now is playing as the best player from his draft class back in 2021 a very good draft class uh a guy who is playing like he can be the best player on a good team and you know obviously we're way off from being able to declare that he's at six games into the season um there's plenty of ways for this to regress back to the mean especially the three-point shooting i don't think he's going to be a 39 percent three-point shooter all season long um as great as that would be It'd be pretty damn awesome if he could um but it's just he's just kind of changing the tone and tenor around all the big picture questions around this team and honestly those big picture picture questions feel more like you know opportunities and feel like there's a lot more optionality i guess with what this team can do because scotty's doing this thing and we said this before the year right like if scotty takes the leap a lot of these other questions become less significant, less dire, less kind of uh, franchise defining necessarily. And I'm just excited now to kind of see and dig into all of the information we can glean in the next few months of, hey, who fits, who doesn't, what's what's it all doing, how is it all working? And, and, you know, we're getting getting some answers already, I think. You know, I think OG Ananobi, for example, boy, oh boy, does he look awesome to start the year. I mentioned Scotty Barnes' on-off numbers, a plus 18.3 point differential when he's on the floor. Yeah, not even close to OG Ananobi. Uh, 37.1. That is the on-off differential for OG. Uh, they are 37.1 points better per 100 possessions when he was on the floor than when he is off. It's pretty amazing. He's a pretty awesome player, and he's uh, been off to a very good start. Seemingly should be in the plans and fits beautifully next to Scotty Barnes. But again, we're still in the early days of figuring all this out, what works, what doesn't. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm just I'm almost at a loss for words already. And we're six games in. I, I'm just th thrilled by everything we're seeing from Scotty. The one thing he's kind of leaving you wanting with right now is his work with the all bench looks. And look, this is partly to do with I don't think he's playing with great talent in those all bench looks. You know, he's been playing a lot with Malachi Flynn, Gary Tran Jr., Grady Dick and Chris Boucher as that sort of second unit. Precious Achua sprinkled in there when he's been healthy. And, uh, you know, not my favorite lineup. It's getting absolutely pasted in their minutes so far in a small sample, but they're getting demolished. And I, I think it makes sense. Like, there's not a ton of creation outside of Scotty there. It's a pretty small lineup defensively as well. Um, you know, I think Scotty did a pretty admirable job last night hanging with Joel Embiid, but 
you saw like this game was lost at the end of the third quarter because that lineup got run off the floor and just didn't have the juice to hang. And it won't be the same all season, right? Like Grady Dick's going to hit threes. Gary Trent Jr. will start to hit threes. Two of five last night. It was nice to see. But, you know, when Malachi Flynn is pretty decidedly your best reserve, <laughs> I think that is, you know, great for Flynn. He had a nice game. He had a couple of nice pops on both offense and defense. But uh, if he's your best reserve on a given night, you're probably not getting a great night from your bench. And I think that's been kind of a recurring trend here. I think these lineups get better with, uh, you know, OG and Anobi getting sprinkled in there, as we've seen a little bit, that sort of duo staggering while Dennis and uh, Pascal and Yach kind of take the other sort of staggered lineup. And that one's been pretty heavily used as well. Um, and I also think, you know, Otto Porter Jr. makes those lineups make a lot more sense too if he's in the place of a Chris Boucher or a Grady Dick or a Gary Trent Jr. or even a Malachi Flynn if you want to have Scotty kind of run the show. I, I think, you know, there are pathways here for lineups that make sense. That lineup in particular, not a huge fan of. You'd like to see Scotty be able to carry that lineup more, but I don't think that's necessarily fair. I don't think he's kind of being thrown into the best position to go and succeed with that lineup, um, especially considering just guys aren't hitting shots right now, which brings me to Grady Dick. In the what did Scotty and Grady do today segment. And look, this was a rookie ass performance from Grady Dick. I think probably his worst game so far as a pro. 14 minutes, held scoreless, has one assist, minus 17, a team worst. Um, you know, didn't even attempt a three, which you don't want to see. You know, I'd rather see him go one of eight from three than 0 for 0 from three. Uh, the two sort of stark extremes we saw over the last two games with him, you know, looked a little bit. Uh, sort of jumpy. He had a, like a couple what I thought were wide open threes, but it seemed like he didn't quite really realize the amount of time he had. Uh, there was one where Joel Embiid was closing out and Grady kind of just like panicked midair and made some sort of play and it just kind of fell apart. It wasn't, I think he might have traveled on it. Um, you know, just like, you know, rookie stuff, right? I think he had a couple other opportunities, like he had a floater on the baseline where it just looked like he didn't think he had all the time that he did. And that's the speed of the game stuff, right? That's all going to come to him. His processing is very good. Um, we see the way he reads the floor, the way he moves around the floor and uses space to his advantage. I'm not concerned about Grady Dick, but I do think, you know, sixth game in nine nights, even though he's not playing super heavy minutes, I think you're seeing kind of the effects of a, a rookie kind of, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot of game time. It's a lot of schedule. It's a lot of travel that he's not used to as a player. And there's a reason like the rookie wall exists. I'm not saying he's hitting the rookie wall right now, but maybe a mini wall after six games and nine nights for a guy who, you know, again, coming out of college, he's 19 years old. Um, I'm not worried. I still think he needs to play because I think his spacing and general sort of presence on the floor is a positive thing for how they play, but definitely not his best effort in this one. And that is what Scotty and Grady did against the Philadelphia 76ers on November the 2nd, 2023. We'll come back on the other side, round it out, with the good, the bad, and the hmm, we'll talk a little about the starters. And uh, I'm going to talk a little about how much I miss Marcus Saul. Yeah, that's coming up in just one second. Before we do that, however, got to tell you about our dear friends over at FanDuel, the number one sp spot in the world. If you're going to go and put some money down on sports, they are America's number one sports book for a reason. And right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 money line bet that wins. So you get 150 bucks. Just if your team wins on a single $5 money line bet, that's a great deal. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Maybe you want to go take the over on Scotty Barnes points the next time out. He's scored 20 or more in five straight games. Want to ride that sort of momentum train? You can go ahead and do that. If you want to take the under on Raptors points scored, that seems to be a pretty good bet as well this season too. Um, or take the under on points allowed against their oppose, uh, opponents as well. Probably not like in the worst shape if you're taking the under on the total for every single Toronto Raptors game this season. Either way, go, go visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season in style. The NBA season, of course, as well. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL and of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right. Rounding it out here on your Friday episode of the podcast with the thing that we do at the end of all these game recap shows, which is, of course, the good the bad and the hmm, the very well-named segment that is not clunky and bad at all, uh, where we run through a thing I liked, a thing I didn't like, and a thing that's got me a little interested or intrigued about, uh, you know, the team or something coming up. We'll get into the good first, and the good for me, the starters, which I did not see coming. I really didn't. I thought this offense was going to be 
such a really grim scene that it was going to be something that felt untenable. But turns out there's a lot of talent in that lineup and they're making it work. You know, not their best night last night. I think they lost a little bit on their overall numbers just, uh, you know, because the Sixers were very good and all of that. But I thought they were pretty capable and did some good stuff out there. And they continue to do good stuff out there and have basically all season long. I mean, one of the best heavily used lineups around the NBA. Uh, 146 total possessions over five games together. A plus 19.9 net rating per clean the glass. 117.1 offensive rating. You'll take that all day. Very good. And a 97.2 defensive rating, which is not surprising to me. That lineup has defenses of horses one through five, especially with Scotty playing the way he's playing. And that lineup is going to be a bear to try to score on all year long. They're also grabbing all of the rebounds. 80% of all defensive boards the Raptors are picking up, and they're running like hell off of those. 56.5% of all available rebounds are going to the Raptors when their starters are on the floor. Um, again, I didn't love their work in the half court. Even in the game against the Sixers, I thought it was a little bit you know, iffy here and there. I wouldn't have minded seeing Pascal take on some of those creation duties over Dennis Schroeder. Who I thought, you know, wasn't amazing in this game. You know, he had his moments. He obviously he's he's hitting shots at big times and all of that. Um, there's nothing wrong necessarily with Dennis Schroeder and what he's doing, but um, you know, th they still have things to work out in the half court. They're obviously living in transition, and that's great. Like this defense is going to be good enough in that lineup to power transition in great abundance. But um, you know, it, it, it's there's still a work in progress. I'm sure it will get even smoother on the offensive end as they kind of figure things out. And as teams eventually adjust, if Pascal and Scotty and Dennis are going to be firing away from three, they're not going to be totally unguarded on all those for all the whole season. Like scouting reports will shift and change. Um, they have to keep hitting them obviously to make that matter. But um, I'm uh, really, really pleased by the starters so far. It does leave the question of like, what is ha what happens to Gary Trent Jr. here? You know, his best spot, I think, is probably as a fifth option alongside good players in the starting lineup. There are times you can get him into those lineups, I'm sure, as you kind of do your rotation over the course of games. I'd like to see more of Gary playing with good players, and I do think that's why I like the Gary and Grady along with Dennis, Pascal, and Yak lineup because you do have good players that Gary gets to play with and get some good looks as like a number five option. Um, but I do think what I'm noticing with Gary Trent Jr. And I like, I don't think he's getting into the starting lineup anytime soon because the starters have been so good. There's no need to change it whatsoever right now. Um, but the thing that I'm noticing with Gary is it does feel like the 0.5 offense thing is coming the slowest for him of any player on the team. It just seems like he needs some time to make the next read, make the next decision. And this has always been a thing with his playmaking, right? He's not someone who's kind of seeing things multiple steps ahead or anything like that. But in, in this case, like, He's doing a lot of what I'm calling thinking dribbles because I look, I, this is the thing I do when I play pickup basketball, I make thinking dribbles. I get the ball dribble a couple times, think about what I'm going to do and then move it on. <laughs> and it does feel like Gary Trent Jr. is getting caught in the trap of thinking dribbles as well. And that's kind of slowing things down. It's, you know, any sort of momentum a possession has kind of dies when it lands in his hands. Um, you know, again, this is not, he's not part of the bad. He's not part of the good. He's just kind of a, an interesting kind of piece in relation to the starters being so good so far. Um, fascinating to see if they can kind of get him on track. Two of five last night from deep, though. Nice to see uh, at least some th three start to fall for him. The bad. Um, this is just sort of a bigger picture thing. You know, it was really nice the last few years. The Raptors seemed to always kind of have an answer for Joel Embiid. Obviously, the last couple seasons in particular, it was just super aggressive doubling and making him very uncomfortable. He'd still have his nights, but they did not, really uh, allow Joel Embiid to kind of get to his spots that he wants to get to with impunity. Like they were very, very mean in the way they sent doubles at him and forced him to pass. And the Raptors had a lot of success against Philly for that reason. And then of course you go back to the Marcus Gasol days, you know, the zero point game in the 2019, 20 season, one of the greatest regular season games you'll ever see. Boy, does it hurt not having a guy like Marcus Gasol. And look, no teams have Marcus Gasol. Very few teams have any chance of stopping Joel Embiid. It was really cool to be the team that kind of could do that, though. And I don't think that is in the Raptors' repertoire. Kind of going back to the top of the show, this is just a tough matchup. And as good as Jakob Pertl is as a rim protector, as a defensive backline center, he's just not nearly strong enough to hang with Joel Embiid in the post. And that was the thing that Marcus Gasol just kind of had, right? He was a, a tank, just weighted to the ground like a tree with a deep root system as Joel Embiid tried to do stuff against him. Yach doesn't have that. He's fleet of foot. He's got a lot going for him, but strength 
against the very strongest guys is not necessarily one of those things. And it does really make you appreciate what an incredible thing it was to have Mark Gasol on your team. I don't see the Raptors having very good luck against Joel Embiid over the course of this season. You hope they don't play him in the playoffs. And look, it's not a question that needs an answer right now. This is not a contending team. They don't need to gear their roster towards deep playoff matchups just yet. That will come in time. You can make a trade like the Raptors did for Marc Gasol to handle the Joel Embiid thing when you are in that moment. But uh, yeah, it just I had some appreciation and some longing feelings for Marc Gasol watching that game last night because it was really nice for a little while there to be the one team that seemed to flummox Joel Embiid more than anybody else. Seems like those days are behind us. And that leaves me feeling a little sad. That's your bad for today. And the hmm to round this game out. It's just looking ahead to Sunday, man. I watched a lot of that game last night. I actually fell asleep before Wemby really went off in the second half. Um, but Victor Wembanyama, first Raptors opponent, the first Raptors game against him on Sunday. Oh, this dude. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous what this dude is doing and how quickly he's doing it. And how impossible he seems just as like a human being that exists. Uh, fascinated to see how the Raptors go and hang with him. I, I don't know how they intend to defend him. Defending him is very hard. You can just kind of like throw it into him and his giant octopus arms are going to grab the ball five feet over anyone's head. And there's only so much you can do. He's just like dropping balls in over Drew Eubanks and leaving him looking completely helpless. Um, you know, I, I wonder how they approach it, right? It's going to be fascinating. Like, wouldn't mind seeing OG get a little run against Victor, just kind of seeing, hey, can he get into the into the dribble a little bit? Uh, can he kind of bully him around a little bit just as a very physical defender? You know, we know Wemby at this point is not exactly, uh, you know, thick, I suppose. Um, and I, I'm just fascinated, man. It's going to be super fun. The Spurs look pretty good. Uh, you know, they I think they're going to kind of have nights where they look like world beaters and nights where they look not very good. And that's kind of been the case so far this year. But they will win some games, and they'll put a scare into a lot of teams. I mean, they beat the Suns twice in a row on the power of Wemby, basically. Um, so I'm just I'm thrilled. I can't wait to watch it. I, I've been watching so many Spurs games, I feel disgusting because it's just like Spurs basketball, really? I, I've been used to it being so bad the last few years, but now it's can't miss TV, and it's cool that we get to see the first Raptors-Wemby game on Sunday. So that's my hmm. It's just a huh. How's that going to go? Is it going to be a disaster? Are they going to get murdered by Wemby? Maybe. If you do, I don't think there's any great shame in that because that dude is incredible um we'll leave it there thank you so much for tuning in as always please uh support the show by following subscribing rating reviewing etc etc it's much appreciated when you do that and uh we we love you so so much we love our everydayers if you are an everydayer of the show thank you so so much if you're not an everydayer of the show what are you doing come listen every day Who, you, want, you want more me more that's not a good sell uh, but either way Please uh, also join our Discord server. The link is in the description of the podcast. We'd love to see you in there. Uh, it's a great little community we got building around the show. Like 240 little sickos strong just talking Raptors ball and uh, having a great time doing it. No a-holes. That's the one rule. Don't be an a-hole. And if you're not an a-hole, you're going to fit just in. You're fitting just well or perfectly well in the Discord. We'd love to see you. Um, we'll be back again on Monday. We'll break down a game against the Spurs, look ahead to the rest of the week, and uh, we'll work in a mailbag show sometime next week, I'm sure, as well, as the schedule lightens up just a tad. Um, so get your mailbag questions in. Of course, mailbag questions are only getting answered by Discord people as well. So uh, join the Discord, drop your questions in the mailbag questions server over there, and they will be a part of the rundown for the next mailbag show we do sometime next week. Maybe Wednesday with Katie we'll do that. We'll have Vivek, of course, coming back next week too. All sorts of good stuff. We appreciate you so, so much for tuning in and have yourself a wonderful rest of your boot weekend. Enjoy Scotty versus Wemby. And uh, yeah, have a good one. We'll talk to you Monday. Bye-bye. Thanks for hanging.